singing in our hearts. We want to enter into your presence, Lord, with praise on the lips. And Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice, giving your only son, Jesus, to die for our sins. We thank you that we are clothed in him and his righteousness. We thank you that you give us this heavenly clothes to wear as we enter into your presence. You are the king who is glorious and who is mighty. You are high and lifted up, God, and we want you to be enthroned on our praises this morning. And we invite you here and ask you to fill this place, fill our hearts, and overflow us, God, with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. We want to fill up on you. We want to bless you this morning as our Father. You are a good Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Every soul, every beating heart, every nation and every time, come find hope in the love of the Father. All creation will bow as one, let them rise, see the risen sun, Jesus, Savior, forever and after.
God, I just thank you so much um, that you are perfect to us in all your ways and that we can trust in you. And I just pray that you would um, soften our hearts, that we would receive what you have for us today and um, that you would, um, that they would be your words and um, that we would just draw closer to you. And in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and turn and greet somebody next to you. <laughs> All right, good morning. We are going to be back into Colossians. We'll be in chapter 3 today, so if you don't have a Bible with you, we'd encourage you to follow along with us. Please do. And just raise up your hand, and we'll get you a Bible into your hands. And again, we'll be in Colossians chapter 2. Hopefully you men got your Father's Day uh, gift, right? So on three, you can just shine it. And from here on out, if you shine it at me, we kill you! No, just kidding. I know, like I, I was telling first service, it, if, if, if I was sitting out there, I, I would have this thing apart, put back together, the lens out, I'd be figuring out how to pop out the LEDs, it'd be rolling all over the place, and my wife would be mad at me, so sorry about the temptation, ladies, for your men, but <laughs> anyways. A few quick announcements. Um, just uh, first of all, church work day is coming up this Saturday, and we'd love for you to come out and help. It's a great time to fellowship. Men are great when they're working together and, and all, and so there's uh, various different things that we need help for, and we'd love for you to sign up too so we can kind of decide and lay out those things for you. So um, we'd encourage you to do that. So that is next Saturday. That's a big thing. Uh, the other thing is, hey, there's cards, more cards available for True Love. I'm going to talk about that in a in a minute, but uh, truelife.org. And so as you're leaving, please, if you need more cards, grab more cards. If you don't need more cards, give away the ones we gave to you last week, okay? <laughs> and uh, we encourage you to do so, and it's a real blessing. I got to give away three this week, uh, so I didn't do all five, um, but um, it was a blessing. Um, I'm going to, you know, just start off talking about evangelism a little bit as we talked about the Great Commission last week. Now, how many of you were able to give out some cards this week? Okay. Now, how many of you guys were blessed as you gave out cards and invited people? Right? So, almost everybody raised their hands. Everybody else who gave out cards, you get beat up or something? <laughs> what happened, you know? <laughs> and again, the idea behind these cards is not to replace evangelism. Remember last week we talked about um, how Andrew, his, his notable biblical event was going to Peter and saying, come and see. And so it's being able to say to people, come and see. But certainly when you put it out there, you're also opening the door to teach them how to be, how to be a Christian. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little bit this morning because I've been encouraging you guys to figure out how to share the gospel in a, um, in a quick fashion, if you don't have a whole lot of time, a, conci a concise fashion in a very, a very clear way. And I think every Christian ought to have the gospel in their pocket. Now, again, I do believe the most effective form of evangelism is to family because they get to watch you change and watch your life. And if you're truly being a witness, they cannot deny that something's happened. Right? And then it's like co-workers, and, and again, you can be a witness, and you can handle pressures. Uh, you handle pressures differently. They notice the differences. 
and they're able to see a change. And therefore, you're able to speak with them. You have more time. You can speak into their life, speak to their interests, and so on and so forth, and, and deal with issues that way and, and, and all. But, but at times, you're, you're in a spot, you're in a position where the Lord lays upon your heart, man, share with this person. Or you may go out and, and share purposefully um, in, a, in a park uh, or, or some setting, or you're in line somewhere, or you have someone's attention just for a few minutes. But I encourage you to have a good grip on the gospel. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a few minutes and, and share and then challenge you guys to ask me some questions or tr to try to resist my sharing with you, okay? And so it'll be interactive, okay? So you might be live on the radio or whatever. <laughs> You'll be immor immortalized on, on the uh, website. Excuse me. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? Well, about what? Well, I'm out here, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and, and I'd like to share with you my hope that I have in Jesus Christ. Now, what happens? People say, oh, okay. I go, I just want a few minutes of your time. And, and so they may say, okay. Um, or you might go to someone, and can I share with you, and what do they say? No, and you go, okay. Here's a card, <laughs> right? Now you have that other tool to where even if they say no, you can say, hey, there's some answers on the back. Here's our church. If you ever need anything, we're here for you, you know, and you walk away. But what are some other excuses when you want to share with someone? What are some other excuses people give you for your, your message not being valid or why you shouldn't be sharing it or, or whatever? What are some of the things that people say to you? I don't have any money. I'll forget you then. <laughs> I don't have time. Okay. Here's a card. I'm out here. I care about people. God loves you. Here's a card. There's some answers on the back if you go to that website. Okay. What's another one? Wait, what, what's that? Okay. I went to church as a kid. Awesome. You have a foundation. So this, what I share with you isn't going to be so new, but let me remind you as an adult things about the Lord. And then you say, hey, what is the whole Bible about? It's about man sinning, man getting in trouble, not being able to get into heaven. And then how do we get into heaven? You know, you've heard it said that for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. What's God's glory like? Well, Psalm 130 tells us if God kept a record of wrong, who could stand? The answer is nobody, Right? Because he's, he's morally perfect in absolutely everything through all time, everywhere. Every molecule, if there were molecules of God, are absolute perfect. You know there's some things God can't do? God can't have a sinful thought. He can't. He can't do that. What about you? Can you have a sinful thought? <laughs> right? So what I'll share with people is like, okay, so, so God created this time-space continuum, and he put people in there that he could fellowship with and wanted to fellowship with and, and we sinned and we broke that fellowship with god now eventually this time space continuum is going to be done and god wants us to be with him in eternity or abundant full life we can't be because we've broken fellowship with him he's perfect we're imperfect they don't mix they're oil and water they don't mix and so how can we be saved and well that's the story of the whole bible from beginning to end, Theology 101, God made him who knew no sin to become our sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I'm a sinner, but God was figured out a way to declare me and make me righteous someday so that I could forever be with him. Okay, and so you, you, you step into that. Okay, Kate, I think you had a, another thing. I don't believe that stuff. Now, you can converse with people if they say, I don't believe that stuff. Well, what do you believe? What do you think happens when we die? And you can ask them, have you ever been to a funeral? Most people will say yes. And you've seen a dead body? Yeah. Do you think the person's still there? You know what they always say? No. Where'd the person go? Let those questions that you have when you go to a funeral, it is so weird. You look at a body and you realize the person is no longer there. Where'd they go? An unbeliever, an evolutionist will still say, well, they're not there. They still answer that way because they, they naturally understand that, 
okay? So I don't believe in that stuff. Well, what do you believe? I, I'm, I'm just interested. What do you believe in? And let them share for a little while. And you go, you know, it's, you know, it's amazing. I, I have all my own thoughts. And then I looked at the Bible and I realized that what the Bible was telling me made so much more sense. And it resonated with my spirit. And then you can say, so I've heard what you say. Can I now share with you what, what I believe? And, and, and I want you guys to realize this. And, and I say this every so often, probably more often than I realize, that God planted eternity in every human being's heart. And I don't care if they're Muslim or Hindu. When the gospel is shared clearly and properly, there's something that happens in their heart. And they have the option to reject it or receive it. Do you believe what the Bible says? The Bible says that God planted eternity in every man's heart. And also says in Romans chapter 12 that he has given each man a measure of faith. I think people can believe. Do you believe that? And so if that's the case, when you're sharing with someone or, or you're afraid to share with someone, you need to realize your message is going to hit a spot. What happens if they get all angry with me? You know what you've done? You've hit a spot. Because someone that really doesn't believe it is not threatened by your message. If you come to me and you tell me that unicorns save, I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to go, okay. Because unicorns aren't a threat to me. I really don't believe they're real. <laughs> but people get upset. I'm sorry, you know, my little pony people in here, you know, but <laughs> we're not the my little pony church, you know. We're <laughs> we believe in Jesus. But they get upset. Because I, I want to challenge you with this idea. Paul was probably the worst Christian hater, one of the worst recorded Christian haters we have, right? He was vehement against Christians, and he, and he would walk for days to get to Damascus to go drag Christians back so he could kill them, put them under a death sentence. And what did he become the second he let go? Probably the most active, vibrant Christian we have recorded in the scriptures, right? He was the ener ener uh, energizer bunny apostle, right? He just, they beat him up and he just keep on going. The Timex apostle took a licking and he just kept on preaching. And, and, and so you'll, you'll get that reaction, you know. Um, but a lot of people say, oh, I just don't believe that stuff. Well, what do you believe? Everybody believes something, right? Everybody's driven by something unless they're absolutely empty in despair. And then the question is, how's that working for you? There's joy available, isn't there? There's peace available, there's purpose, and there's assurance of eternal life available, and you can't buy it. But we possess it in the knowledge of God. We have it to share. Any other excuses? I'm not ready. Okay. It's a good one. That's a common one. And, and uh, oftentimes when I share with people, I'm not gifted with evangelism. Someone gifted with evangelism is the closer. They're always leading everybody to Christ, right? But I'm to do the work of an evangelist. And so my attitude is this. If they reject it and say, I'm not ready, they're not rejecting me. But what I do when someone's in that situation and they've been kind to me, and I really, you know, if, if you're really nice to people, they normally respond nicely, right? And, and so um, when someone says, I'm not ready, um, I ask them this. I say, so I've explained to you the gospel message and I've asked you if you wanted to receive it, and you said no. I respect that, okay? Um, but let me, let, me, you know, let me let you know, I don't know how long your life is going to be. I don't know how long you're going to live if you'll, if you'll die tonight or in the next 10 minutes. I don't know. Or if you'll live to be 100 years old. But I've shared with you how to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, how to have eternal life, right? Yeah, you have. Now, if you lay your head on the pillow and you decide it's time for you, you to give your heart to God, you would be able to do that, right? Yeah. Or if you're in the hospital with a terminal uh, disease, you would know how to reach out to God because I've shared that with you, right? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to make sure that you're equipped for salvation, right? And what an honor it is to be able to equip people to be saved, right? 
And, and, and you guys remember people witnessing to you. Now, I was a backslidden Christian in college. Of course, I didn't look like a Christian. Therefore, people properly witnessed to me when I walked across the quad, <laughs> you know? And I would go, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. You know, and they're looking at me like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, and I was just backslidden. But um, they, would, they, would, they were just trying to equip me to be saved. And that's what we do. Any, any other opposition that you have? The Bible is written by man. How can I trust it? You know, you know, when people bring up something like that, that's like a six weeks course in theology, right? Real, I mean, there's a lot of books, volumes of books. When people do that, I say, you know what? That's a good question. That's a good question. And you know what? I've had to ask myself that too. And so what you're doing is you're putting yourself in their shoes, not saying, that's a stupid question. Because God wrote it, that's why. Right? That's what we say, because God said so. Right? That's what we do. Instead of saying, you know, that is a good question, right? And, and if you've ever asked that question and looked for answers, you found those answers, right? And, and please, if you're doubting it, please look for the answers because they're there. And not only has God answered it for you, but you're going to be able to answer it for other people that you're able to take the time with. But here's a card, and on this card is a website where you can go to truelife.org. And if you want to research that more, it's there. But let me tell you, I've thought that. Now, you might think I'm brainless, but I actually have one, you know, but I've studied this out, and I've become convinced that I can trust God's word, that they are God's word, spoken through people using their personalities and their backgrounds to convey to us eternal truths that are from beyond time and space, from God, and God gave it to us in this Bible, and I believe that absolutely. Now, can I share with you what I believe? God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteous of God. And you bring it back. That question is way too long of a question to be able to answer with someone without getting the gospel message out there. But we have a way to take them to a website where they can research that. You know, but I always tell people when they ask those questions, I always say, please, you ask the question, seek the answer. Right? My friend told me it's full of errors. You know, so your friend is going to keep you out of heaven and he doesn't know what he's talking about, right? Uh, other, someone else yelled out something. I'm not religious, neither am I. <laughs> you know, and then we talk about a relationship with God. There's all kinds of religions out there. And, and people have built up traditions. And, you know, traditions, you know, things start off as something, t something good. You know, like the statues in the Catholic Church started off as, as ways for people to remember lessons because they couldn't read. They were memory tools, but they were there so long that they eventually became sacred and then something to be worshipped by some Catholics, not all Catholics, but by some Catholics, they, they, they worship and venerate the, the, the image of the statue, which the Ten Commandments says not to do, right? But Baptists can do the same thing because for a long time, the tie was a sign of glory, right? Jesus never wore a tie. I mean, it's like weird. We wear ties. They're like nooses. I don't get it, you know, but that was the holy thing, and you know, Sunday's Sunday school. He always had to have Sunday school. And I think Sunday school is wonderful, but the world got busy and people stopped going, which is unfortunate. He used to spend three or four hours at church every week instead of an hour and 20 minutes, right? That's good, but it doesn't work anymore, so let's do something that works. Small groups in the evening, different times, whatever. Discipleship at different times, whatever it might be. So we use, we use different things. But... Um, I'm, that was a not, I'm, I'm religious, I'm, I'm not religious, right, yeah, <laughs> go meet my pastor, he's totally irreligious, <laughs> anyways, I any other, um, I'm Catholic, oh my gosh, we're in South Texas, that is the most common one ever, right, and I'm not saying Catholics can't believe, but what, what, what I tell people that say I'm Catholic, that's the most common one I hear, I'm Catholic, and I go, okay, I'm non-denominational. And they look at you like... <laughs> and I go, that's, that's fine, you're Catholic. And, or I might ask them what that means to them, right? I'm Catholic. And they're trying to say, I'm saved, the church has declared me saved. But what I tell them, I say, well, okay, that's fine. But, but you know, Catholic Catholicism is, they, they do a lot of things that are religious, right? A lot of religious acts. They go, yeah. And I go, okay. So if you remove all those things off the top of Catholicism, you want to know what the Bible says 
their Bible and my Bible, which is the same. You want to know what's the same about the two? They believe Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It's part of the Trinity, right? They believe he died on the cross. That's what the crucifix is all about, to pay for your sins. That's, that's, that's there. It's still there in their Bible. And number three is that you, that you receive that by faith and faith alone. And it doesn't matter what you believe after. I mean, it matters what you believe. But, but to get into heaven, to believe that Jesus Christ died for all your sins, even your bad doctrine, that, that is there. That core thing is there. That's something that we share. And I can say, we share that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? And have you received that by faith? If you have not, you can, if you have not done that, you can do that right now. And you can take him to Romans chapter 10, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Whatever it is, you can take him a bunch of different places. You know, I'm Catholic, okay. You hear that one all the time. And, uh, and it's like, no, stay away from me. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot a lot a lot of a lot of people are going to try to send you out here but but a lot of what you're hopefully hearing is give them a quick answer or a quick way to divert them back to the gospel. And just go that's interesting. How do you think you're saved through aliens? Because the Bible talks about salvation for all of eternity. So can I share with you what I believe? Again, to believe that it resonates in their heart. God has planted eternity in their heart. And there's a string that's plucked there. And, and, and I don't care who it is. The Bible says God has planted eternity in their heart. The Bible says that God made man in his image. He gave us characters, communicable attributes that he also shares with us that enables us to have fellowship with him. And so when people lay their head on their pillow at night, they think about deep things, right? You're not the only person that did that. Everybody does that. And they're trying to distract themselves with all this entertainment, and drugs, pleasure, power, whatever it is, so that they don't think about it. But to believe that every person needs that message is just so very important. Now, the verse I kept on quoting is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. That's my go-to verse, Okay? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever would believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that is John 3, 16, but look at John 3, 17. Jesus isn't gonna send me to hell. Jesus, I, I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. John 3, 17, read it, man. It says man is already condemned. Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus came to save the condemned. He wouldn't send people to hell. You're, you're already going there. And so he came to seek and save the lost. You know, and so different verses, man, get to know it and answer those questions that you have. And so I do want to encourage you, a, a, a way to start down that road of sharing, will, you, you will see people respond. You will see opportunities open to share the gospel. Re, be ready to do that. And you know what you will find? You will find you growing. And you will find that you get more excited about the Lord. You will find that you get better at answering questions for the lost. And, and it just, it just, it's a snowball effect to where you're always looking for the opportunity. One more thing before we get into uh, Colossians, and obviously it's going to be a shortened study uh, this morning, is um, it is Father's Day. And uh, the first thing that God ever set up in the Scriptures was man and woman. And he told them, be fruitful and multiply, right? The optimal stability force in the world is the design of man, woman, and children living together in a permanent relationship and raising children in that solid way. That is God's staple before any government was ever formed. The standard the most healthy way to develop uh, a family relationship or to, to develop society and culture and stability. And I want you to understand the biggest problem in our country is fatherlessness 
or bad fathers, men that don't know how to be men. That is the biggest common denominator amongst every one of our great problems in our nation. You go into the prisons, you know what you find? People without dads. You go to the abortion clinics, you know what you find very often is, is uh, women who didn't have fathers, and they don't dare want to bring a kid into this world the way they were brought into the world very often. You know, and, and, and they've been promiscuous and they don't want to, you know, you find it. Poverty. What's the single biggest common denominator in poverty in America? No dad in the home, right? Violent crime, gang membership, drug use, on and on and on. School dropouts, bad grades, on and on and on and on. It is the common denominator. Moms are so intense with their passion and desire for kids, that they're going to they're gonna work till death to raise those kids right. But kids still need a father figure. Listen, some of you in here, and many of you in here, and we're in a different age now, where you're a single parent, or you've been, you've been raised in a single parent home, and you're sitting there going, oh, you're calling me damaged good. Listen, we're all damaged goods. But if you're in here and you're a single parent and you have children, you have a family of God right here. And you have aunts and uncles, you have coaches, you have teachers that you can find that can mentor those children and give a good example of what a man is to be. Because a man in the home sets the standard of how to be a man, and a man in the home sets the standard for little girls on what kind of man she's going to choose. And the church stands there as a place where you come, as a family of God, where we as men need to model that to all the kids in this church. Even if kids have dad in the home and they're doing a great job, we're still reinforcing that message. And so what does that mean? That means men in general, not just married men that have kids, are also meant to model something very important to those around them. Whenever I do premarital counseling, one of the first questions I ask is, are your parents married? And did you have a good father? Right? Most of the time, mom's working her tail off no matter what. Mom's been good. Do you have a dad in the home? Dads are so important, so much so that you need to understand, I do understand God is the most nurturing, <coughs> loving, tender being in all the universe. He's more tender and loving and sensitive than any woman could ever be. So he represents that spectrum. But he's also more dutiful, courageous, and strong than any man also. And so God made man, male and female, he made him. Right? And so we represent the wholeness of who God is. But let me ask you, how does God clearly throughout the Bible unashamedly represent himself to mankind? Father, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the reason is, is because we need that strength to be clearly portrayed by our God so that when we don't have a father, we now know that we have a father. And it is so much harder for someone that didn't have a good dad to understand the strength and the protection of dad in the home. And what I'm saying is, man, women, hats off to you. You guys are amazing because you will die and, and you will work three jobs and you will come home and you will make that house a home. But I tell you what, you men who are upstanding men and you're doing a good job, praise God. Praise God for you. You have taken that incredible thing called testosterone from God that can be a really evil, bad thing. And you have used it for God's glory. And I want to encourage you to continue to do so because this country is seeking to neuter men from women and men and, and women. They're, they're trying to divorce women from femininity and they're trying to divorce men from masculinity. And you know what? Stand up against it and be counted as men. We need you. Everybody needs you. And, and if you've been a, a good father and have sought to be a good dad, and if you have taken the, the child that doesn't have a father figure in his home and you've modeled that, thank you. You, you have helped create a, a healthy human being that is now prepared to be a good husband and a good father and someone who ultimately can receive God as their heavenly father. 
and, and it makes such a huge difference. So I want all the men, not just the fathers, to stand up, and we're going to pray for you right now. Dear God, I thank you for these men that are here, God, and for those that have come in who didn't know a good earthly father. God, I just pray that even now you would be modeling for them what it means to be masculine, to be dutiful, courageous, strong, and a model for the culture around them, God. And that you would be their dad in just a deep, rich way. And any hurts of the past would melt away as they come to know what a true father is like in you. And Lord, for all the dads and all the grandpas and all the uncles and, and uh, the older brothers and the half-brothers and the step-brothers and the adopted grandparents and every other relationship with, that we have with those around us as men, Lord, glorify yourself in that, Lord. May we be true, good, real, positive representatives of what it means, that side of you that represents that duty, that strength, and that courage, that protection, and that provision in the world, God. May we truly, regardless of what the world tries to convince us of, seek to know what it means to be your man. And so bless these men. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and may we embrace what you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may sit down. Colossians chapter 3, we have an hour and a half study. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> it could be. But Colossians chapter 3. 3. Did I say 2? 3. Okay, Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to go ahead and read verse 1 through 3, and we'll get into the teaching. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but it's, it's funny. You walk around college campuses, and, and guys wear pink shirts. It's kind of weird, right? But I understand this because I was in college at one time, and, and I was poor, so I would go to the laundromat, and I would gather, you know, four weeks' worth of dirty clothes, and I would throw them all into one load. So inevitably, my whites ended up being pink. And you just had to embrace it, right? Because you can't get the pink out of the white. It just becomes the new black, right? <laughs> you just embrace it. But listen, when you're baptized, it's representing the fact that you have died, and we'll even say died, D-Y-E-D, died into Christ's character. Because you're symbolically dying into his death, going into his death. You didn't die, but you're, you're symbolically going into the grave, and you're being lifted up in new life. You're now absolutely, fully, completely, radically changed. And so we died with him, and we rise in new life. And it should affect every part of what we are, every fiber of our being. Died in the wool of the Lamb of God to the core, never to be the same again. And we need to embrace it. Many people will say, well, I got saved, and, and they, they kind of add Sunday to their schedule. But when you have been changed at the core, when you have been possessed by the most powerful being, not some cheap little weak demon, but you've been possessed by the Holy Spirit of God, an almighty, eternal being, I think you're changed, right? I don't think faith saves, and I don't, I don't think faith makes you, or works save you. Uh, uh, faith does save, but I don't think works save you. But what is the one thing that is tangible when someone has faith? Works, right? Fruit works. You change. You're different. So a lot of people say that they have faith, but they have no works, and there's no real change, right? At least that you know of. And therefore, I always tell people, you can tell me you're a Christian all you want, but if you look like you're not, I'm going to witness to you. Because we all in this room can agree that Taco Bell is healthy for you, but it doesn't make it healthy for you. We're lying, right? 
And so, faith without works is truly at least questionable. But the Bible says it's actually dead. Because when you've truly been changed, your life is affected. Now, if you're trying to work to be saved, that doesn't work. But if you are saved, you're going to be changed. Died in the wool. Every fabric of the very fabric of your being. Now, he's already shown us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says that we're buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And then in Colossians 2.20 it says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of this world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to its regulations? You've died to the principles of this world. Now, the reason Paul is talking about this with the Colossians, let's go back 2,000 years to the city of Colossae. And in Colossae, the church was started by one of Paul's protégés or one of Paul's students. And, and, and Epaphras went out from the school of Tyrannus there in Ephesus, and he traveled a couple hours east up the valley to Colossae. He started sharing his faith with people because he was trained well by Paul, and a church started and blossomed there. Now he finds out that Paul is in jail in Rome, and they want to send gifts, and they want to minister to Paul out there in Rome. But news also comes to Paul from this very same man about what's happening in the church of Colossae. They start to blossom, they start to grow, people are getting saved, lives are being changed, and all of a sudden, the Judaizers come and they attack them. You gotta be a Jew in order to really be saved, right? We talked about that, that's legalism. So they're attacking them, and, and pagan cults are now attacking them, but a, a new group of people that we hadn't run into before, we know them as Gnostics. The, the, the up, you know, nose uppity people, we have this deep knowledge that, that you guys don't have. And so I, I know you say faith without works is dead and everything, but we have this new doctrine. And what we believe is that the body is flesh and sinful, and the spirit is perfect. And what you do in the body can't dare affect the spirit because the spirit's perfect, right? And so what they're saying is you can just live like hell in the body and still be going to heaven in the spirit. But Paul's saying something totally different, isn't he? He's saying, you're radically changed. You've, you've died with Christ, and now you've raised a new life. Don't go back to your old ways. It doesn't work. You're totally radically transformed. And he's fighting Gnosticism with this beautiful, wonderful truth that we need to understand this morning, okay? He says also in Colossians 2, 6, therefore... As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. If you become a Christian, be a Christian, right? And so we see there again in verse 1. If, you, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so in verse 1, he says, seek those things which are above. And in verse 2, he says, set your mind on things above. Now, that word seek is an interesting word, and it means having an urgency and a desire and an, ambish, an ambition, and you're motivated to, to get something done. When you got saved, all of a sudden, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? What, what can I do? What can I do next? And you're so frustrated because you weren't growing quicker, right? How come the pastor won't let me have the pulpit, man? I'll let him have it. You know, you've been saved for two weeks, but you're on fire, man. You're just charged up, and you just are anxious, and you're seeking, seeking, seeking. Your whole life should be like that, seeking and hungry for it. Don't let it die. You know, but you have this anxiousness in you where you want the things of the Lord. And what happens is all these other things start to take back over again, and Paul would say, don't let that happen. Clear up the eyes and see clearly the glory that's set before you. Go for it. And Paul never slowed down, did he? He, he had this drive. I remember uh, when I was um, dating Noreen, I was in Australia at a surf contest, and it was Thanksgiving night uh, in, in America, and they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in Australia. I don't know what's wrong with them, but they don't celebrate it there. But, but it's the day after Thanksgiving in the afternoon in Australia, right, because of time changes and everything. And it's Thanksgiving night, and so we've been dating a little while, 
And I was the kind of guy that couldn't listen to focus on the family because I wasn't ready to be married or have a family. And so my wife, or my future wife, knew this, and she's, and she's praying, and I'm not giving you an exact prayer. I wasn't there, but, you know, from my perspective, it was something like this. Oh, Lord, he has potential, but Lord, take this bum out of my life if he really isn't my future, <laughs> you know? Or lay it on his heart that it's possible that we may be married. And we figured it out that exact same time that she was praying in California Thanksgiving night. The next afternoon, I was actually surfing after work out at Surfer's Paradise, and the Lord just lays it upon my heart. Like, I'm thinking about waves. You know, if you're a surfer, you understand this. It's like, you're surfing? You're surfing. Nothing else matters at the moment. And all of a sudden, it's like, I gotta marry this girl. I gotta marry this girl. I gotta marry this. And it's, it was the weirdest thing. And I had this drive. And I had another contest in, Aus in Australia for the next two weeks, and, and then I was, um, I was in Hawaii, and I was waiting for her to come. And, oh, I'm going to marry on Christmas. I have a Bible study praying for me. First thing I do to get to Hawaii, I buy a ring, and it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and she's wearing an old boyfriend's ring, not because she still loved him, because it was a cool ring. We eventually turned him into earrings, and so, um, <laughs> but... Um, but I asked her to take the ring off her finger because I didn't want that to dirty my ring that's going on there, you know? And I was never jealous before that, but she's like, what's your problem, man? You're all weird. But you have that drive, right? You understand what a drive is. What is your drive? Paul would say, seek those things which are from above. Develop that drive. Focus on that. And what's keeping you from that drive? What's wetting it down? What's distracting you from it? Seek those things that are above. Oh, does that mean I get all weird, heavenly-minded, and trippy? No, people that are weird and trippy are just weird and trippy. People that are heavenly-minded are earthly good, because whatever they do, they understand matters for eternity, and therefore, they're making the most of their days here on earth, because their purpose is focused, because they're seeking those things which are above. Jesus said it this way, you know, all those things, I know you need them, that's cool, everybody else needs them, but they're not your drive. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and watch how I prepare for everything else. You ever try them on that? I really want to seek God first and, 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 and watch how he provides the rest. That's a promise from God as far as I can tell. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Try it. He, it's a promise from him. And so you're of greater earthly good because your purposes are eternal. Let's just say you're a doctor and you're not a Christian. You believe in evolution or whatever. And when people die, they just become warm food. Okay, that's your outlook. And you totally believe it. Why heal anybody? They're suffering. They're going to die. So you heal them. So now they've suffered, been healed, just to suffer again and eventually die. What a bummer. But what if you're a Christian doctor? Someone's not a believer. You heal them, and now they have more opportunities to know Christ to change for all of eternity, right? Seeking those things which are eternal puts purpose in everything, guys. It really does. Part-time Christian, no. Part-time Christian, you don't get the benefits. <laughs> Full-time Christian, you get all the benefits. Seek those things which are above. Are you heavenly minded? So if you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Number two, set your mind on those things above, not on the things of the earth. Set your mind, and it really means set your affection. From Neo is a Greek word, and it means to have understanding, be wise, to feel, to think, to direct my, one's mind towards a thing, to seek for and to strive for. Is your work merely a way to make money, or is your work a way to serve the Lord? It's an opportunity to serve the Lord, right? Is your marriage merely a way to have kids bring pleasure to yourself and companionship? Or is your marriage a witness to a lost and dying world also? Right? That actually puts more meaning into your marriage. Is your home a place to hide and protect your your stuff, or is it a place of refuge for the weary, a place of safety for the lost, a place of peace for the upset? Are your hobbies mere hobbies, or are they an opportunity uh, uh, to reach out to those that you normally wouldn't reach out to? 
right? Listen, if I cut my hair, I want my hair cutter. It's not really a hairdresser. I don't have much hair to dress, but if you cut my hair, I want you to know Christ. If you work on my car, I want you to know Christ. See what I'm saying? If you're next to me on the airplane, I want you to know Christ. Everything that we do, set your mind in that direction focused. If you're motivated, motivated by the things above, you're motivated by, you're motivated by the things from above. But if you're not motivated by the things from above, what are you motivated by? Things from not above, right? Now, it's not bad to be working at your job and seeking to do well at it, to raise your kids well, to provide a safe environment for them, to do, be a good businessman and everything like that. But what is your primary motivation of life? Because people that reach the pinnacles of these areas find that there's no fulfillment there. The possessions they purchase are never quite what they were supposed to be. And they might be the exact item that you ordered on eBay and you got fast shipping today from Amazon Prime and it's a thing and it's showing up and you rip open the box and it's everything that it said it would be, but the feeling inside of you is not what you wanted, right? How many of you guys thought that marriage was the answer once you got married and then you found out marriage was a lot harder and took a lot more work than you actually believed? And if you didn't put up your hand, you're a liar. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to make it very satisfying. And it certainly is different than what you expected. Right? So the relationships that you form are never as satisfying as you thought they would be or should be. And the dreams that you pursue are never as fulfilling as you hoped they would be. And so there's rich, powerful, prosperous, successful people that are absolutely miserable out there right? And we all say, try me. Well, if we put our hope there, we would not be happy. Switchfoot wrote a song called Beautiful Let Down. And that doesn't sound right, but it makes sense once they explain the song. Because the idea was, once these things failed me, I found the Lord. So I was let down by the world, but the Lord was there to catch me. Some of the lyrics go this way. It was a beautiful letdown when I crashed and burned when I found myself alone, unknown, and hurt. It was a beautiful letdown. The day that I knew all the riches of this world had to offer me would never do. And it goes on to say, we're still chasing our tails at the rising sun and our dark waters planets still spinning in a race where no one wins and no one's ever won. But who's there at the end? Christ is there. And he makes everything different. So we're thinking, and you're all agreeing with me if you're a Christian, oh yeah, seek, hunger for, look that way, yeah. Is it easy? No, oh, not at all. That's why he has to tell us to do it again and again and again in the scriptures. Matthew, back in the Sermon on the Mount again, Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. Wow, that's a pretty heavy key for us to actually keep that Christian life and motivation going. Instead of just adding Christ to your life on Sunday and paying a few bucks when the thing goes by or whatever, you know, good show, pastor, here you go. And then you walk out and you live like hell the rest of your week. You're never going to find any satisfaction in that because God, the church, the family of God, your ministry, the spirit of God living in you is not your focus. You haven't invested your treasure in it. You know what I, I tell couples that are having a hard time in marriage counseling? One of the things I always tell them, one, keep being intimate, okay, because you're investing in the other person. Two, be spiritual together, pray together, because you're investing in God together, right? And three, take walks or find something you both like to do and spend time together, right? What have you invested? Your body, your soul, and your strength your emotions, you know, your, 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 your spirit, and your body. Where you put your treasure, where does your heart go? 
you're not getting along at home, men, and you go to work, and there's a lady there that's actually paid to respect you. <laughs> that's funny, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> We'll call him a secretary. They're paid to respect you. Oh, man, they're respectable. So you're not getting along at home because there's tension in kids and, you know, dogs chewing through the fence and weeds growing in the yard and there's conflict. So you go to work. Men aren't really good at sharing emotions, are we? We avoid emotions like the plague, but we go to work and we, we pour out our hearts to our secretaries. What have we done? We put our treasure where it doesn't belong. We, we put our emotional treasure somewhere where it doesn't belong. Where does our heart go? To that woman. We divorce this woman, marry that woman, and what happens? The same thing again. Pressures of life. So men, you know what you need to do? You need to invest in your wife. Emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Absolutely. Invest in her. Your heart will follow and it's so awesome to be in love with your wife more at the end than at the beginning. More investment, more love, more time, more heart. And that's what you need to do. Women, same thing. Your, your, your treasure is your emotion because your emotions are so much more beautiful and deep than men. My husband doesn't listen to me. And then you go talk to some other man or the neighbor across the fence or someone at work. Happens all the time. We need to recognize Jesus told us the key. Where you put your treasure, your heart follows. What do you invest in God? Jesus said, do this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Your heart. Do you put your heart into the things of God? Dedicate to the things of the church? Want God to use you in other people's lives for his glory? Your mind. Do you study the things of the Lord? Do you actually ask questions of God? Do you study Facebook more than his book? right? Where, where's your investment? Where's your time? You know? And, 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 and your, your, your talents, your possessions, where do you invest it? Why do you put your treasure? There's your heart. You know, my garage is full of bikes, racing bikes, right? Because I, I did triathlons, and, and so I race bikes. And I tell you what, those bikes are still hanging in my garage, and I haven't raced a bike in like three years. I mean, one time on a Sunday morning, I was all broken up because I went over the handlebars and knocked myself out in a race on Ocean Drive before church. <laughs> you know, I really haven't been the same since. But the bikes are still there. You know why? I pieced them all together off of eBay as a cheap person would, right? And so I bought every little piece a total discount from this and that, and Shimano this, and SRAM this, and, you know, whatever, Compolo this, and this bike seat, and that, those handlebars, and this tape for those handlebars, and those cables, and everything. And I put them together. Well, let me care. I invested so much in those bikes, and I can't let go. Do I do that with God? Because we seem to be able to let go of God. Now, granted, we have reasons because Satan hates the fact that we're dedicated to God. Our flesh is screaming out, it wants flesh, not holiness. So it's screaming out, get away from God. And so God has to remind us, and he knows we're weak again and again and again. Seek first the kingdom of God. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Become a living sacrifice. You know, and, and draw. We, we need to invest in him. Our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And then it says in verse 3, it says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so he's saying, you've been died. You're totally different. You're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're completely changed. You're declared righteous in heaven. You're on the way to being sanctified here on earth. You have every opportunity, every possibility. I've spoken to you through my word, and, and I've given you this family, the church, and you have pastors and teachers, and you have friends, because you're in Christ. You don't have an option now. It's like, you, you can choose to be miserable in Christ like a backslidden Christian, or you can be choose, choose to be all in. And he says, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are new, you are different, you are dyed in the wool, embrace the pink, right? I mean, embrace the fact that this is what it is. And I can never be the same once again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Is that good news for you? 
It's very good news for me. <laughs> you know, I think it's probably really good news for most people because I have the opportunity to live a life that I could never live in the flesh. And I have an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives that I never could before. And everything that I do actually matters instead of nothing mattering. Right? Because again, if you don't trust in God or believe that there's a God at all, what really matters? But if you believe in God, everything matters. And you have purpose every day. So do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. Don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. And so Paul's passion is to say, don't follow these Gnostics who are telling you, it's like, go crazy in the flesh. Because Paul knows if you go crazy in the flesh, the satisfaction and the fulfillment and the difference you make for eternity is not going to be there. He says, as you've been died, you need to consider yourself, or you, you've died in Christ, you need to consider yourself to be alive in Christ now. And then he says this in, in verse 4 of Colossians 3, he says, when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Oh, that's such awesome news. Jesus said this, John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself may raise him up on that last day. He's going to do it himself. John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. You know, this crazy thing, we look at our lives, we're a mess, God's perfect, we're not. Jesus died for us, you know, died for all our messiness, and he, he, he embraced us. He knew how bad we were before he even saved us, and he still chose to save us, knowing all those bad things. He's not surprised when I sin, he still knows when I'm going to sin, and I'm all messed up with myself, going, I can't believe I did that. God goes, I believe it, but I still died for you, and I still love you, Right? And my passion is to be with you. He even prayed uh, the, the night that he was betrayed. He prayed in the garden, dropping sweats of blood. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given to me be with me where I am in order that they may see the glory. He just so passionately wants us to be with him. And Paul is saying, understand, you're looking above, not down. You're looking there, not here. Let this incredible love and this incredible being motivate you and drive you through this life. It's the best place to be. It says in 1 John 3, 2, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. Our character is going to be completely changed to conform to Christ's character. We'll still be us and we'll still have all of our weird quirks and personalities that aren't <laughs> sinful because God made us each uniquely to glorify him in special ways across the spectrum. But we'll, we'll be without sin. We'll be full of love. How incredible will that be? Philippians 3, 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. Oh yeah, we should, right? Look up. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I believe the church will be raptured, and I believe we will be with him when he comes back after the tribulation period. It says in Jude 14, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Revelation 19, 14, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. I mean, so many awesome things he has for us, guys, that we can look forward to, but we got to look forward to him by knowing that they're there, by spending time with him, knowing his character, being driven by that character, and knowing the promises that he has for us, waiting for us. You know, he has a nickname for every one of you that only you and him share and know. How cool is that with God, the creator of the universe? Right? Well, God created the universe. Yeah, he's God created the universe, you know. Like, you're just one of like seven billion souls on earth but he has a nickname for you. I don't think he's going to nickname me loser either or foolish, but he's got, he's, he's got a name that we're going to share. He's going to look me in the eyes and he's going to say, 
Come on in, check it out. Man, I've been preparing this for a long time. My good and faithful servant. To me, and to you, but to me. We will be with him and we will be like him. He wants us to be ready for eternity. How do we prepare for eternity? You know, people prepare for retirement, but what's that, a few years? You know, wouldn't it be cool if we could live retirement when we're young? And then work when we're older, you know? <laughs> we don't have the energy, but, you know, we'll give all that energy that we don't have to our bosses. Oh, man, he has such better for us. You can just do a study on heaven and just get blown away and charged, right? But what we do is we neglect it. We get distracted by the shiny new car, which in Corpus Christi will rust really quickly. You get an Alpha Beta ding on it or a, a HEB ding on the door, right? When those start happening. They do construction on the road, man, rocks. I never had as many rocks thrown at my car than I, when we moved here to Texas. I think it just rains more and the road like breaks up more. Potholes and stuff, rocks in my window. It never fails, man. If I want a rock to hit my window, my windshield, I just get a new windshield. Rock's going to hit it like first week, right? It's like, oh, I can see. Boom. Oh, man. <laughs> but I'm okay because I have heaven. I can put up with this stuff because I have heaven. And every so often I get mad at someone, I think about it, and I go, but I still have heaven. They don't even have heaven. Why, why am I being a jerk? Right? Where's the best place for our eyes to be? on the Lord. We're better men, we're better women, we're better students, we're better workers, we're better neighbors if God is our priority over everything else. That's how we stay on track. Set your eyes on heaven. You're died in him. Every fiber of your being is different and that's what he's called us to be. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you on this day, this Father's Day, that you've encouraged us, Lord, to look up, and it's not to be disappointed, it's to be driven and charged and thrilled and educated and sustained and healed and moved and blessed and purposed. Oh Lord, may we embrace all that you have for us, that at the end of our life we may be able to say as Paul that we've run the wet race, we've, we've finished, we're, we're cooked, we're ready to go home. Instead of being worried about all the stuff we left behind undone. Help our, our heart, our eyes, our everything to be pointed towards heaven, that we may have, be of great earthly good for eternity, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the service with a little bit of worship. We do encourage you guys, if you have any prayer needs whatsoever, we have people to pray for you on the sides over here. And I'll be up here to pray with you as well if you have any prayer needs whatsoever. But you guys heard the gospel in a pretty clear way today. And I'm not going to say if you want to know Jesus, come forward. I'm saying you need to know Jesus. Please come forward today and pray with us. We'd love to pray with you and for you so that you could know this drive, this motivation, this complete change in your life. Don't let anything get in the way. We would love to help you on that road, on that walk, not a highway to hell, but, a, but, but a, a narrow road to heaven. And we're here to help you with that. And so I would just really challenge you today. If, if you know, if you've just been playing a game and you know you're not saved, we, we would love to pray with you and for you, and you do need Jesus today. And so if you have other prayer needs, yeah, we'll, we'll pray with you, but, but certainly if you don't know Jesus today, we would love to have you come up and, and pray with us. Now, during this time, it's also a time to worship the Lord through tithes and offerings, and we do that just because it is a form of worship, and some like that, some would rather put in the boxes or send to the office or however you desire to do that, but we do that as a, as a courtesy that for those that desire to do that during worship time. So the ushers will come forward. As soon as they pass by, you can feel free to stand up and continue to worship the Lord um, however you would. And I just encourage you guys to have a wonderful rest of the day, and if you have your father still remaining in your life, uh, just uh, bless them with a thank you. Let's go and worship the Lord together.
Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you, to be in your presence, and to hear from you through your word. Lord, I pray that we would just meditate upon what we've learned today, that you would help us to remember the things that you've taught us this morning. And we ask, Lord, that we would glorify you in the way that we live our lives, in the ways that we think, in the words that we say, in what's in our heart, and in every way, God. May we be pleasing to you. We love you and thank you for being such a wonderful, wonderful father to us. We ask you to go before us and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed rest of your day. Uh, we'll, we have another song of worship. If you'd like to stay and worship with us or if you need to pick up your children from the Children's Church, uh, please do so. But please come back and worship.
Y'all have an awesome Amen. week. <laughs>